Good day and welcome to the City of Charlottetown Presents Podcast for Seniors. Today, we're going to be speaking with John Meacher. He's a retired RCMP sergeant. He spent a significant portion of his long career investigating fraud and creative fraud awareness. So let's get on with it and talk to John. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, uh, John, and let's get right to the thick of things. Can you tell me what is fraud? Sure. Well, n- number one, I'm very happy to be here. So fraud. Uh, the best way to explain fraud is to have a compare and contrast between fraud and theft, as most people understand what theft is. But, and, and it boils down to this, unlike theft, which is a physical crime, somebody has to physically take something away from somebody who owns it. Fraud is a crime that relies upon deception to achieve a gain. Uh, and that could be somebody else's money and or personal information. And if that's not clear, I, I can expand on it. But the other way to explain it, and this is important, if theft is illustrated as a sad thing, because the one hallmark of a theft, if you leave something of value in your car and you come back to the, your car and the window's broken and the valuable thing is gone, you know right away that you're a victim of a theft and you're going to have a sad thing. Whereas what often happens with frauds, when it initially happens, the person, the victim, is actually often happy because they actually think that they've either won something or they've just extracted them themselves out of a tricky situation. And people who experience fraud, there's usually a delay between when it's occurred and when they realize it's occurred. And that realization can happen hours, days, sometimes years later. All right, thank you. Um, so how did you get into investigating fraud? Well, that is kind of funny, funny from my perspective. Um, when I joined the RCMP way back in 1987, I had a list of things, bucket list items, things that I wanted to do. And fraud, investigating fraud was never one of them. And I remember within the first six months of me uh, heading out to BC, my first operational hosting, I, I had an opportunity to talk with the fraud investigator. And I was asking, so what do you do on a daily basis? Oh, it's really exciting. I sit down, I look at spreadsheets, I look at financial statements, and like I get right into the thick of it. I said, oh boy, I, that's um, about as much fun as pouring pouring lemon juice in my eyes. And I said, that, that's not for me. But then around about mid-career, I was posted to London, Ontario. And uh, I, I was in a unit that was actually having the funding diminished. The, the, the funding was uh, becoming less. So there was fewer funded positions for that particular unit. So as a result, uh, the detachment commander was looking for placements for everybody on the team. And he came up to me and says, John, I've got an opening on the commercial crime team, which is a fraud unit. And he says, are you interested? I said, oh, I don't know about that. And and he says, look, come down to my office and I'll see if I can convince you. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And uh, at first I had a couple of really dull investigations. uh, And then along came, it was a financial who done it. It was basically a, a refugee who fell for an online scam, uh, specifically an inheritance scam. And because it was a whodunit, it was very challenging, which appealed to me. And it was dealing with really bad guys because who is going to target a refugee? People who come here for a safe place to live. These are really bad people. So they, they stole, they, they, they defrauded the victim of over $40,000. Uh, and, and then we took over the investigation and we actually were successful. Despite that, there were a lot of naysayers saying that we'll never catch these guys. We did. And, uh, well, well, well we caught one. We caught the guy who actually, uh, was responsible for receiving the money and dispersing the money. So $40,000, um, 
Take a guess, and that would have been around 2004. Take a guess what the, the, what the sentence was once he was convicted. Oh, I don't know. Five years? Okay. Maybe at one time in Canada's history, and, 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 and trust me, uh, your, your guess is in line with a lot of Canadians. He got 200 hours community service no. and no restitution. So one of the more difficult, challenging discussions I've had as a fraud investigator was explaining to the, this refugee how our justice system worked, or maybe doesn't work. But back then, as a member of the RCMP, I could not criticize the justice system, whereas now I can. Uh, so he's just looking at us like, like we had like a third eye or something. Anyway, he wasn't very happy. We honestly weren't very happy. But that's what it was. So it was at that point I said, okay, that kind of interests me. So my first involvement in fraud was only two years in London. And because I was already committed to a posting at our uh, National Security Counterterrorism Unit in Toronto, I went there, I was there for five years. And then after that, I returned to fraud in Toronto for another uh, eight years. So I spent roughly a third of my career investigating fraud. And for the most part, it has been rewarding especially dealing with the uh, uh, fraudsters un unknown. We actually had to find out who the fraudster was before we could uh, actually make any headway on the plot. Why do people commit fraud? Okay. From my perspective, I, I, I'm most likely oversimplify it. But if you were to ask a fraudster, they'll, they'll offer you like a dozen different reasons. But basically it boils down to uh, there's two elements. One, a person has to have a criminal leading. And two, they're willing to either exploit a situation or create a situation to be exploited. And the difference is every now and then you'll hear about a bookkeeper. And I just throw this out as an example. Uh, most bookkeepers are, are, are very law abiding. But every now and then you'll read an article where a bookkeeper for company ABC uh, discovered three years after the fact that the bookkeeper was helping themselves to some of the assets of the company. A and sometimes that could be pretty substantial. So there you have somebody who had a criminal leaning and simply exploited their situation where they were the person who was actually writing the checks and there are no other checks and balances in place. And then professional fraudsters will create opportunities. And uh, that's basically endless. So, John, it's not unusual that seniors come across a scam uh, almost every day of some kind or another. And uh, it's getting more frequent that even, uh, you know, as seniors, we know another senior who's actually been affected by a scam. What's the difference between a fraud and, and a scam? Okay, great question. And, and a lot of people... Uh, get hung up on that, including uh, some of my former colleagues who didn't investigate fraud. Uh, they, they thought that a, a fraud, when you call something a fraud, was a specific thing or act, and a scam was something else. All scam, the word scam is, it's a casual term. Uh, a fraud and a scam are one of the same. The only difference is the word fraud is a legal term, uh, when somebody is convicted of a fraud, you're never going to hear a judge say, I, I, I sentence you to 200 hours community service for this particular scam. They're going to be calling it a fraud. So it, it, it's just a, a, a formal versus a, a, a casual name. Uh, for the most part, they're interchangeable. How great of a concern are scams and fraud in Canada? Okay, from my perspective... Uh, fraud is out of control in Canada, completely out of control, especially uh, scams that are enabled by either our phones or, or the Internet. And, and I can paint that picture that they're out of control just by using statistics provided by the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. Now, while I mention that, Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, and I'll mention it several times, Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre is run by the RCMP the Ontario Provincial Police, and uh, Canada's Competition Bureau. And they're basically, for lack of a better phrase, 
a central clearinghouse for all things fraud in Canada. So they collect a lot of statistics. And the statistics I want to draw your attention to are, are for a couple different years. Back in 2017, they reported that the total fraud reported the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center was just over $112 million. That's substantial. And the years leading up to it were generally less and less and less as you go back in time. So in 2017, it was 112 uh, million. Uh, in 2020, that went up to 165 million. In 2021, that amount went up to 384 million. And in 2022, that amount is over 531 million. Those are substantial numbers, but it gets worse. Because based on analysis done by the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center, they've determined that less than 5 to 10% of the people in Canada actually report fraud. So that means that fraud is a multi-billion dollar criminal enterprise, which is a huge concern. But it doesn't stop there. The other thing that we have to be cognizant of when we talk about what is the, the fraud picture like in Canada? We also have to keep in mind that the victims are real people, real people who will feel uh, the impact of fraud way beyond simply just the financial loss. It can be embarrassment, and that's one of the reasons why we have such a low reporting rate, which can lead to emotional toll and extreme cases. It can lead to, unfortunately, people contemplating suicide, attempting suicide, and actually taking their life because fraud can be absolutely devastating. Who is most at risk for experiencing a fraud uh, or scam? Uh, and that's another great question. So you, you have the usual perception that there's uh, people who are extremely vulnerable, uh, such as seniors. Uh, people who have intellectual disabilities and newcomers. They are most likely disproportionately targeted, but basically anybody given the right set of circumstances could be vulnerable to a fraud. And I'm aware of police officers who have fallen for a fraud, bankers who have fallen for a fraud, uh, military officers, who are very well-trained, highly educated, more than capable of making decisions, but yet I'm aware of several of those folks who have fallen for frauds, French or capitalists who have fallen for frauds, even criminal, other criminals who have fallen for frauds and retired judges, and the list goes on. So basically at the end of the day, just about anyone can fall for a fraud given the right set of circumstances. What are some common fraud uh, or scams that people should be aware of? Okay. So when you ask about some of the frauds are, that people should be aware of, there, there's an ever-increasing list of frauds. And this is my short list. And again, I make reference to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. They have a, like hundreds of scams and frauds listed on their webpage. And that's a great reference tool for a lot of folks. But here's some of the ones that seem to pop up uh, or are being brought to my attention. There's job scams. There is loan scams. And loan scams are going to become very big now that interest rates are going up because fraudsters will advertise that they can get people a discount rate. And when people are vulnerable to raising mortgages and other loans, Fraudsters are more than happy to jump on that opportunity. Rental scams, same thing. When people are feeling a financial squeeze, they'll start looking for discounts on where they might be able to get uh, cheaper rent. But all they're doing is they're feeding a, a, a scammer. There's charity scams. Whether it is her pain Fiona that hit the Maritimes, especially PEI last summer, uh, fraudsters are quick to jump on that as an opportunity. With, with the uh, wildfires in Nova Scotia, there were scams also taking place, and, and they're going to continue to take place. There's online marketplace scams where people are selling stuff, supposedly at a, a great re uh, reduction on what a real price would be, 
and some people, depending on their situation, might fall for it. There's antivirus scams. People will get emails, text messages that their antivirus is, uh, it, it is uh, out of date or they, their, their subscription is out of date and they have to make a payment. That's a scam. There's lottery scams. There's inheritance scams. There's a bank investor scam. Uh, there's the Amazon scam. Basically, any name brand out there, fraudsters are exploiting it. And they'll exploit it usually a, as a phishing scam. And that can be either a text message, email, or even on social media. There's a grandparent scam, which is a big one right now. And while I'm mentioning the grandparent scam, I'll also mention one of the most effective things people can do to counter that is simply hang up and call their family member or family members. Uh, there's the government imposter and extortion scams, uh, where fraudsters will impersonate Service Canada, uh, CBSA, police, courts, the CRA, immigration officials, and so on. And again, that's another one where if somebody is actually listening to this, uh, the best thing to do is if you have the slightest inkling that this is a scam, say, thank you very much. I have a feeling that you, that this might be a fraud. And uh, please tell me your, your 1-800 number and I'll call you back. The more the person tries to convince you that they are the real person, uh, suggests it, it, it's a fraud. Whereas the CRA, the banks, uh, all of the government agencies are well aware of these scams and they're more than willing to work with the person who is being a doubting Thomas and encourage people to be a doubting Thomas. And, and they'll give you the 1-800 number. But what I also caution is because people can buy 1-800 numbers. I encourage people to go ahead, hang up, look up the right number, 1-800 number, confirm if it's the same number, and give them a call. But there's another word of caution. Uh, if somebody gets a call on their home line, there's this thing called delay disconnect. And this is when uh, people used to have uh, a phone on their main floor, another floor, another phone on their upper floor, and it gave the, uh, the people who lived at that house the opportunity, if a call came in for a son or a child, the parent would just yell up the stairs and say, look, there's a call for you, pick up. So the parent could actually hang up the phone on the main floor and the phone would still remain connected for a few seconds. And generally the person would pick up before it got disconnected. So fraudsters have figured out a way to actually exploit that particular vulnerability. And how they do it is they don't hang up. They simply wait for the person to quickly dial their 1-800 number or even a real 800 number, and they get connected right back to the fraudster or a co-conspirator co -conspirator of the fraudster. Uh, there's investment scams, which are huge. There's cryptocurrency themed scams, which are also huge. Romance scams are huge. And they, those particular fraudsters will target just about everybody. Who, who is old enough to be on a dating site up until they're 90. Virtually, I've, the oldest victim I've ever dealt with for a romance scam was 81 years old. That was somebody's mother and grandmother. Mm. And then there's the other big one I like to draw attention to, although this one isn't focused on seniors to the best uh, that I'm aware of, uh, is, are the financial sextortion scams, where there's been victims as young as 10 years old. And the fraudsters have essentially convinced the victims, pretending that they are actually uh, a child themselves, convinced them to send an intimate image, at which point they start to blackmail them, saying, if you don't send us money, uh, we're going to share that photo with all of your friends on Facebook, Snapchat, chat, or what have you. Uh, and then the other um, scam I'd like to mention is the fraud refund scam. And this is where you'll have fraudsters who as a follow-up to their initial scam, whether it's a CRA scam, romance scams, or, or financial extortion scams, they'll call up and say that they are a special company and they have the ability to actually crack down on these fraudsters and get the money back from them. But all of this is just a continuation of the scam. It, it, it's basically uh, continuing to kick 
the victim while they're already down. Mm. What are some of the red flags we need to look out for when we're trying to, to uh, determine if uh, something is a scam or not? Okay. And, and this, this one's hard because we're getting new scams all the time. Uh, fraudsters will continue to change their MO, how they do the scam. And, and I, I'm going to answer that question by offering a mix of red flags and useful things to know. Uh, and and I'll, I'll start by saying, in brief, any request for money or personal information from a stranger could be a scam. But at the same time, as I said, just to muddy the waters, remember that scams such as the grandparent scam or a romance scam, the victim may not view the fraudster as a stranger. So, although the first part of that advice used to work, but now that there's scams where fraudsters are impersonating children, relatives, uh, or, or a lover, uh, victims of romance scams will often call the perpetrator their lover. Uh, it makes it very difficult to convince them that the person they're giving the money to is a stranger. Uh, Processors love to uh, use pressure to make a, a quick decision and threaten if you don't comply. Like there's a number of scams, the CRA scam, uh, any scam basically where they impersonate the government, the ultimate threat that they'll use is if you don't comply, if you don't pay this fine, uh, the warrant out in your name uh, will result in you being arrested by the end of the day. But... At the same time, it's important to keep in mind that although some fraudsters rely on urgency, there are other scams such as, and not limited to, romance scams, investment scams, and certain extortion scams can go on for days, weeks, months, and sometimes years. Uh, and a lot of times revolving around uh, both extortion scams, CRA, and their various uh, variants, and investment scams, the fraudsters will really drive home the point that this is a confidential matter and not to share the information with the authorities or family members or relatives, which makes it challenging. Uh, urgency, uh, again, will be articulated in both emails and text messages. And I all, I, if people actually take one thing away from this fraud chat, I always try to encourage people to pause. Don't act right away. Take time to ask a knowledgeable friend. Some people in my position will say, uh, talk to a friend, talk to a trusted friend. The problem with just talking to a trusted friend, I've been involved in fraud investigations where they did talk to a trusted friend who unfortunately was not any more knowledgeable about frauds than the victim. And they both went down the garden path together. So I always suggest talking to a knowledgeable friend, somebody who's up on current events, somebody who's reading the news every day will, will generally come across news items about fraud. Uh, but just relying on a friend might not be enough. Uh, a phone call from a government official, they'll, they'll often start by saying, who are you? If they're simply calling your, your cell phone, your mobile phone. But at the same time, if they are going by a listed number in a phone book, they might actually call the person by name. So that one response doesn't fit every single criteria. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, if you're getting a call from a government agency, uh, the best approach is ask them who they are, ask for an 800 number, tell them that you will call them, hang up, have a delay, look up the number, uh, and so forth. Uh, with grandparent scams, they'll start off one or two ways. They'll start off sometimes where the fraudster involved in a grandparent scam will simply say, hello, do you know who this is? And the grandparent will say, no, I'm your grandson. Are you, oh, is this Tommy? Yes, this is Tommy. So the fraudster will make a call on the pretext that they'll just be able to get the grandparent to hand over the grandson's name. And even when the grandson doesn't even sound like the grandson, 
the fraudster will say, but you don't sound like Tom. Oh, that's because where I am, I, I'm, you know that I'm, a, I'm on a trip, a hiking trip to Romania or wherever. Uh, the telephone system here isn't very good. So it's kind of like making my voice sound funny. And the grandparent will say, okay, I understand. Uh, and then the other thing that fraudsters will do, they'll exploit what they find. They'll do data mining on social media. And if they come across a child that looks like they would be somebody's grandchild, uh, and they've indicated on there that they are going on a trip to Mexico, uh, to Peru, to Europe, fraudsters will exploit that. And they'll, and they'll call, Grammy, it's your grandson, Tommy. You remember when I mentioned that I was going to Peru? Well, I got arrested. So fraudsters will exploit every opportunity as possible, including what they find in social media. And then how they get money from the victim to the fraudster is a, a, a red flag. And although a lot of these methods that I'm going to mention have legitimate purposes, fraudsters also love them. Fraudsters will have the victim send money via cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency is huge right now. I think it's the second most frequent method used by fraudsters to get money from the victim to them. Credit cards, prepaid credit cards, money sent through the mail. It happens most likely more often than we're aware of. Money collected at the front door, such as we see often with the grandparent scam. Money being sent through Western Union and MoneyGram. And the number one method of being of money sent from the victim to the perpetrators is through bank to bank wire transfers. That's the number one method in 2022. And fraudsters also love to impersonate. Uh, as I said previously, they love to impersonate everybody from relatives in grandparent scams to police and government officials in a number of extortion scams. And as I mentioned earlier, fraudsters also love to impersonate name brands. If you know a name brand, whether it's Amazon, Tim Hortons, your bank, UPS, FedEx, Air Canada, Walmart, to name a few, fraudsters are exploiting them. Uh, fraudsters are more than happy to use threats against you or your loved ones if you don't pay. And specific to refugees, they have no problem in threatening a refugee that they'll be deported if they don't pay a particular final penalty. Another red flag is a, a windfall of some sort all of a sudden appears out of the middle of nowhere. And those windfalls could be a lottery that the person has no idea they've ever entered. But the fraudsters are experts at persuading their victims that, oh no, uh, did you ever go to a mall a couple of years ago and you fill out a piece of paper and you put it in a, one of those little boxes and the per victim will say, oh yeah, I remember that. Well, that's how you won this $2 million. The two don't line up, but fraudsters are simply, uh, they're very capable at manipulating the victim, getting what information they need to further their scheme. Uh, phishing it, it is, uh, it, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, phishing is a, a huge concern right now. And uh, the number one concern, red flag, is anytime you get something from a company, whether it's Tim Hortons, UPS, uh, Air Canada, so on and so forth, any name brand, or even government agencies such as the CRA, they want you to click on a link. Don't click on the link. If you actually think that it applies to you, give the company a call. Give that federal agency a call. Don't click on the link. Clicking on the link will do one of two things. Either they're going to have a form that you're going to fill out and you'll end up handing over all of your personal information, including credit card information, or you'll end up launching malware on your device, in which case you risk somebody getting all your personal information through that method or possibly taking over your device. The phrase, if it sounds too good to be true, it generally is. Uh, and that that's applicable as we are driving around that, that deal is far too good that can't be true to going to on, on various uh social media uh buying cell sites where all of a sudden you're seeing like a uh, washer and dryer for sale over a thousand dollars and all of a sudden you see somebody selling a pair a new uh excellent uh functioning pair 
for $400. Again, if it's uh, too good to to be true, it most likely is. And the last thing I want to say about red flags, it's also important to keep in mind that frauds can appear anywhere and they can come from anyone. The people sometimes have this notion that frauds have a certain look. They don't. Uh, Frauds can look like just the way anybody else out there. And in some cases, I've investigated frauds where the perpetrators or the facilitators were actually friends and family members, colleagues. Frauds will appear at the front door. You can get uh, so, something in the mail from fraudsters pitching a scam. Uh, they can appear in your workplace. Fraudsters have even uh, exploited places of worship. And of course, on the phone and online. And uh, the other thing I want to mention, specific to grandparent scams or romance scams and, and other scams, fraudsters are now exploiting artificial intelligence to manipulate photos, vid- video feed, and voices to appear as if it's somebody else. And that can make it very challenging, especially with the grandparent scam. There was a recent example in Newfoundland, I believe, back in March, where a, a fraudster from Toronto was basically, and this is the assumption on behalf of the police and, and me reading between the lines. It sounds like the perpetrator from Toronto uh, gathered small audio clips of grandkids uh, and they were able to take artificial intelligence and basically construct their own message that they then called up the grandparent and said, by the way, uh, this is Officer Meacher uh, from the RCMP. Uh, yes, your grandson is currently uh, in jail because he, he uh, was caught stealing or he was involved in a vehicle wreck uh, wh- where he hurt people. And as a result, he has to uh, pay bail and he doesn't have any money. And he said that you'd be able to help him. Would you like to speak to him? And of course, any self-respecting grandparent not wants to help the grandchild. And the next thing that happened, the officer Meacher was a fake. Uh, and now they got the kid on there. The fraudster now have that audio clip. And through the benefit of artificial intelligence, they're able to make everything the fraudster says sound like the grandchild. And at one point, uh, good advice for romance scams was uh, because romance scammers would avoid going on conf- video conference calls, Zoom or FaceTime or anything like that because they're impersonating somebody else, somebody's uh, photo that they harvested off a, a Facebook page or whatever. But now artificial intelligence, again, uh, fraudsters are able to exploit that. So they're able to take that one picture and basically construct an online uh, video chat that will actually make it look like uh, the person, somebody else is actually talking to them. The person that the victim of the romance scam believes should be talking to them. Uh, And at this point, it sounds like there is a workaround for victims. Uh, As long as the video feed is looking, the person is looking straight at the camera, that method will work. But if the victim should ask, And this works today. This might change tomorrow. If the victim were to ask the fraudster to turn left or turn right, apparently it will fall apart at that point. But it's just going to be a matter of time where easily accessible uh, artificial intelligence will be able to remedy that as well. And again, I'm going to give another pitch for the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center where they're going to have even more tips. What should someone do if they think someone is attempting a scam on them? Okay. So my, my advice here is actually going to be really concise. Uh, stop communicating. Uh, so, you know, if I get a call, I, I'll go along with it because I, I, I know what I'm doing and I know how to insulate myself. But uh, my recommendation is if you are... Uh, just an a- average citizen or resident in Canada, you want to stop communicating. If you continue to communicate, there's a good chance they'll come back to you again another day with a different scam. Or they, some fraudsters can become a little bit vengeful 
uh, and they might come back just to harass you. So the recommendation is stop communicating with them. The next thing you want to do is you want to take a screenshot or take notes of the phone number, the message, the email, text message, or social media post. Don't click on any attachments, block them, delete the message, and report them to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Center, if the stars align, they have capacities where they're actually able to, what they call, disrupt phone numbers, email addresses, and so forth. And again, a Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. The other thing I mentioned about that, you have two different ways that you can report this to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. Uh, one, you can call them. Uh, they have an 800 number. Their number is on their particular website. And by the way, they're also on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, and, and if people are on either one of those, it's nice to follow them because they'll be, uh, they usually post uh, current frauds of concern. So when you call them, my, my uh, user tip about that, call them first thing in the morning because they're based out of North Bay, Ontario. As the day proceeds, more of Canada wakes up. So if you're on the East Coast, call the first thing in the morning, and it's going to mean that your wait time will be reduced. Whereas if you wait until around noon, hypothetically, you could end up waiting a couple of hours because there's a lot of people calling them. But alternatively, you can report all of your same information online. But I find that a lot of people, especially somebody who might be a little bit vulnerable, a little bit tired, a little bit wearied, a little bit overwhelmed, might find it challenging to actually do the online process. But it doesn't mean that you can't get a family member to help you. Uh, but the other nice thing about calling them, the people who answer the phones are, are pros at this. And if they perceive that the person is facing some sort of crisis, they'll take a lot of time and effort to try to help the person and walk them through. What steps should someone take if they suspect they've been a victim of a scam or fraud? Okay, so but with that, we, when we talk about urgency, fraudsters have urgency. When something like this happens, it has to become one of the most important things in that person's life at that point because there's going to be a window of opportunity. Uh, so the number one thing the person has to do is contact the relevant financial institution, credit card company, prepaid credit card company, money transfer company, if it's Western Union or MoneyGram, et cetera. And, and that's very important if the fraud has just occurred, as it is a narrow window of opportunity to actually stop the transfer. That's really important. Uh, please contact them as soon as possible. And in the event... That this is not just a fraud, but also identity theft. Uh, it's recommended that you call who, whoever your financial institution or credit card company is as well. But you also want to call one of both of Canada's credit bureaus, which is Equifax and TransUnion. Very important to do that because they'll put a fraud notation on your file. And equally important, you want to call your local police. And... Uh, most of the time, if it's something done online or by phone, in theory, you should be able to call them to their non-urgent number and make the complaint there, and they'll give you a file number. Uh, on the heels of that, you want to report at the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. Uh, again, you can uh, report that either by uh, phone or through their online portal. Uh, and again, I draw this. If the victim needs guidance, I recommend calling by phone and asking them for additional advice. And especially if it involves cryptocurrency and your local police agency seems to be unwilling or unable to assist, definitely call them because the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center uh, has a lot of knowledgeable people there who can assist actually police agencies that aren't up to par in dealing with cryptocurrency issues. And lastly, I encourage people who take fraud seriously, see fraud a as a concern, understand that fraud, especially online fraud and phone fraud, is not a local issue. There's only so much that local authorities, local government issues can do, although they all have a role to play in that. 
I highly recommend writing your elected officials, especially your MP, because this is a national issue, and ask them what they're going to do to protect our most vulnerable against fraud and remind them that based on the stats that I've given from the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre that we're failing on this front throughout the country. Uh, and my other recommendation, uh, if you feel as if you're hitting a wall as a victim that you're not making anywhere, making any headway, contact your local media, contact uh, national media, contact whoever you're willing to speak to. Because in a number of cases, uh, victims have actually reached out to media, uh, especially when it was revolving around a transfer from a bank to bank transfer. And there have been examples where because of media uh, involvement, that banks have actually changed their mind and have actually returned the funds uh, to the victim. Not always, but it happens often enough that it's well worth a try. All right. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for all of this great information that you've given us today, but, uh, very important. But uh, before we go, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Uh, it, it, it's just kind of like a, I, I, I hit on this in bits and pieces, but I, I like to focus on uh, confirming with everybody that fraud is not static, it's dynamic, and it's continuously evolving. And fraud can be prevented, but the best way to prevent it is through awareness. And as I just said, as a country, we fail to keep up with that. So the one big takeaway, I encourage everyone who might be listening to this to start having fraud chats with their family members. This doesn't have to be a long discussion. Uh, over at a dinner, maybe just have a minute conversation. Uh, look, look at the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center for maybe tips on how to, uh, the, the fraud of the day or, or a pressing fraud. Just, just have that a discussion. Because the more that we keep fraud front of mind, the greater chance that we will be able to protect our loved ones, especially if they are part of that conversation. And as I said before, if you want to learn more about fraud and fraud awareness, I encourage everyone to check out the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center webpage or follow them on Facebook and Twitter. And Twitter. I remind everyone that unless we get the fraud awareness message to those who need it the most, we will see more wins for the fraudsters, all at the expense of our loved ones. So again, I remind people to write their MP and express their concern, quote uh, the, the numbers that we're seeing. And, and I'll even throw out that uh, if a, any MP or any politician says we're doing enough on this front, and this is something I couldn't say when I was a member of the RCMP, I'll say that politician is either grossly misinformed or is, in, or is lying because fraud is out of control in this country. Well, thank you so much, John, for uh, speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, absolutely. My pleasure. You've been listening to our interview with John Meacher. He's a retired RCMP sergeant. He's spent a significant portion of his long career investigating fraud and creating fraud awareness. Thank you so much, John. You've been listening to City of Charlottetown Presents Podcasts for Seniors. Thanks for listening, and I hope you join us again for our next topic.